Um, some of this, if you've been paying attention to Connect Go, you've probably seen some of these things I'm gonna throw out there to begin, but I think it's important to show the context. And so again, why the chamber got so engaged with transportation from the get-go, one part of it is this, 1.6%, which is our unemployment rate here in the metro area as of December. Um, this is incredibly low. <laughs> I mean, we're always low. This is like record-breaking low. Like there's no one unemployed here right now in this classification of it. And that's our huge problem for us. We're trying to think about the long-term health of the economy which really is important to like the quality of our lives and everything that we're trying to do here, right? Um, if we can't have a pool of folks to pull from, um, businesses, nonprofits, whomever can't do their thing and businesses who can move anywhere will move elsewhere. And so it is kind of like an issue that we've been raising a red flag about for quite a while. And so transportation kind of plays into the workforce piece in a couple of ways. One of those is related to the idea of people who have options with what they want to do. Um, this is an early survey we did from Connect Go. Again, you've probably seen portions of this, um, but we asked how people currently get to school or work. 80% um, said they drove alone. Uh, I will say this is pre-COVID, this particular survey. 80% said they drove alone, You know, 5% carpool, 5% transit, um, smaller percentages for biking, walking. Then we asked the ideal means uh, to get to work or school. And driving alone dropped to 34%. So a small, much smaller proportion. Carpool stayed the same. Transit picked up the biggest increase. Biking, um, well, quintupled to about 11%. Walking almost doubled. And then we asked people, what would their ideal means of transport be for going out for entertainment? Driving alone dropped even further, carpooling picked up, transit stays high. Um, and then other jumped up, which at that point included uh, Lyft and Uber uh, as well. And so even though I don't think that this is necessarily, I mean, this is from a sample of just shy of 3000 uh, respondents that we did in an online survey, also had paper copies that we went out and, and met people um, at events around the metro area. It's not totally representative, it's a volunteer, very voluntary survey, but it represents several thousand people. But I use this to kind of illustrate, even if the numbers aren't exactly right, there's a strong desire to be doing things differently than we're doing them now. And so as long as there's this gap between what people say they're doing now and what people say they want to be doing, um, that's a measure of dissatisfaction. And that's just another reason that someone might move away. Um, when we look around the country, that's kind of, we see similar preferences. So it's not just an Omaha thing. Um, and so when we're trying to attract people here, this also comes into play. So I always talk about with Connect Go and all the transportation work that we do at the chamber. I'm really not trying to convince people to change what they're doing from a transportation standpoint from personally i'm just trying to show that we have a diversity of needs and wants here and we need to have a system that actually meets those needs otherwise um, we're going to be in trouble but there's the other piece of this too of course this is transit access jobs reachable in a 45 minute transit trip um, this is a map of the region if you think about um, Basically, this is a map of where people live and how many jobs they can reach within 45 minutes on transit. These kind of uh, fat gray lines here are the frequent transit service, meaning that buses run every 15 minutes during, during the uh, peak periods. You can see that around the edges of the region, white, there's no transit access. Green, you know, you can get so fewer than 25,000 jobs and yellow, orange. Red, more than 100,000 jobs reachable in 45 minute one way transit trip. Only two small areas around Crossroads Mall here at 72nd and Dodge, and right down around Midtown Crossing, um, around 480, where 480 meets Farnham and, and Hardy. And even there, in the census tract with the highest access, um, if anywhere in the region for transit, uh, only 28% of regional jobs reached. And so again, from the, from the folks who can just, you know, make a decision, this kind of shows that uh, transit is 
not really meeting their needs. It's, it's not strong enough. But the other thing that this shows is people who have to rely on transit, um, it doesn't, it really limits your freedom and your options of where you can go for employment or any other things, really where you're trying to go. Especially when you start to think about the areas of highest under and unemployment in the metro area are in Eastern Omaha. The areas of highest job growth are in Western Omaha and South Lisbon part of the metro area. There's not really any meaningful connection there when it comes to public transit. And so that's where the chamber teamed up with Metro Smart Cities, MAPA and Metro to build a new transportation strategy called Connect Go. And we kind of had these four phases. Um, first, we did a lot of outreach to figure out the goals and principles, what were we trying to do with the work? Um, and we, we uh, capped that off with a document called the Goals and Principles document, where we kind of outlined, okay, what are we going to actually care about here? Then we kind of moved on to evaluating transportation strategies to meet those goals, getting down to actual project level work, and then finalizing the strategy, which is where we get commitments for funding. Right now, we're basically either all the way done or still working on some of those funding commitments here. But again, we did a lot of outreach right off the bat. White Peace Summit, um, Maha, we really kicked it off at Native Omaha Days. In this phase of outreach, uh, we directly reached, um, I think, over 4,000 people. And we landed on these four goals access to opportunity, specifically equitable access to jobs, healthcare, and education by any mode of transportation from anywhere in the region, that being a goal. Um, talent attraction and retention through quality of life improvements. That's both looking at transportation options directly, but also um, looking at how the transportation system supports different types of development patterns, um, for everything from urban to um, historic neighborhoods to suburbs to rural. Economic growth throughout the region. So pulling in freight, is freight moving well? And also, are we using our transportation infrastructure to catalyze higher value real estate development, which in turn feeds into the tax base and helps uh, the uh, local governments provide necessary services. And then fourth, stewardship of the transportation system. Are we taking care of what we have? Are we prioritizing maintenance um, when we can? Um, when we started this project, Metro Transit had one of the very oldest uh, vehicle fleets in the country. Now they have one of the newest fleets in the country. That had nothing to do with us, but I bring that up to say like that matters as much for quality of, of um, service provided uh, as does about anything else. Also though, of course, during this time, the potholes um, became a huge topic of conversation, particularly in 2019. And so that kind of drove part of this as well. So then we did more community engagement, um, started off in person with some cool stuff, but then COVID hit right off the bat. So we pivoted to more of an online and text message based piece of engagement um, during this phase uh, of starting to rank and prioritize different transportation strategies. We reached about 3,600 people. Um, we, were, we tried to offer Again, um, making a really seamless, I mean, a lot of you took this survey, it was a long survey, so thank you for doing that. But we tried to make it available in multiple languages. Um, and again, for people who didn't have internet access, we offered it via text message, um, which I will say, we only ended up getting like three or four responses via text message, but trying to, and then places that were open, we had this traveling booth um, for people could input uh, paper comments. And that kind of landed us on this broad idea of a region built of walkable neighborhoods connected by different modes of transportation. I mean, one of the things we heard over and over, whether in a randomized telephone survey that we did or through the, the online surveys, um, consistently the desire to live in a walkable neighborhood where you don't have to hop in a car to meet all your needs was top of the priority list, making pedestrian improvements top of the priority list, right along with potholes, I'll say, as kind of the highest thing to focus on. 
followed by transit and then a few driving pieces and, and, and biking kind of mixed up in there. But the walkability piece really drove a lot of our work. So then we kind of near thought, okay, we have this broad vision, but we don't really have specific projects. So how do we get to actual funding? So we came up with our top 10 priorities. I'm going to run through these quickly, and then I'm going to return to this urban core mobility system, which is where the streetcar sits. But I think this is important for context because we're not just working on one project or one collection of projects. So Orbit, um, probably all saw Orbit celebrated 500,000 rides. Um, as of about a month ago, um, which is pretty great for a little over a year being open during COVID. The initial line runs east to west from, well, really from 8th Street up to West Roads Mall on Dodge and Douglas, um, which is great from an east-west commuter standpoint, but it's really only meant to be the first part of a larger system. And so we're calling for within the next 10 years, another two orbit lines, the next one going north and south. And we were happy with Metro Transit to be able to announce um, an intention to look at 24th Street for the next route. And with Metro, we won uh, a federal raise grant to begin the engineering work to look at this project. Uh, we'd run from about Q Street up to Ames. It could be orbit, it could be other significant transit improvements. Um, the question there about exactly what it is with orbit, you have stops spacing a little bit further apart. On the North 24th Street corridor, you don't have these defined nodes of development or collection points with higher density ridership. It's kind of spread out along the whole corridor. So consolidating the stops could be problematic for some people who live there or trying to go there. And so I know that's one of the things Metro will look at, but um, they're just gonna, they're just on the verge of kicking off. Um, that detailed uh, planning and engineering study, which is badly needed. Um, so that's a great connection point. But again, we would like to see two more orbit lines in the next 10 years operational. Also local bus improvements, that being kind of the real backbone of the transit network. Uh, Metro is working on this right now, kind of based on a lot of the outreach that we the foundation we set with Connect Go, they're trying to dive into, okay, what routes do we improve? How do they expand? Where do they improve frequency? How do they improve the stop quality um, with more shelters and information and things like that? And I'll say right now, they just, they're just they just about to get into their next round of public engagement for Metro Next. So if you can um, attend one or more of these uh, input sessions that they're gonna be having, um, they've got some really exciting stuff Every option they're looking at, thanks Liz in the chat, um, every option they're looking at is includes dramatic expansions to Metro service. And so let them know what you wanna see on that front. Um, the urban core mobility system, the center point of which is the streetcar, um, but paired with um, more shared parking, less private parking, reconfiguring the street. So converting a lot of the one-way streets to two ways where we can um, to slow down traffic, make it more pedestrian friendly, support retail development, and then an expansion of the bikeway network. Again, I'll return to this at the end and we can talk a lot more about that. Streetscapes, five historic, um, historic commercial districts improved in the next 10 years. Um, we've seen it in Dundee, Benson, downtown Elkhorn, downtown Council Bluffs. It's worked really well. Um, to make a more pedestrian friendly environment, boost business, all the good stuff. Let's do five more, uh, North 24th Street and South 24th Street around um, the plaza at Inn are both kind of high priority areas for us right now, but what else can we be looking at around the metro area? Sidewalks, 100 miles of sidewalk gaps filled near elementary schools and transit routes. That's priority for us. Um, On-street bike lanes and trails, 100 miles of bike lanes added. Right now, we're at only about 14 miles in the whole metro area, which is way behind where we ought to be. Um, we've got over 300 miles of trails, but it doesn't really provide that transportation access to the jobs, education, and healthcare piece that we're focused on. But um, still, another 50 miles of trails would be helpful in closing some of those gaps in the system. 
multimodal Missouri River Bridge. This would be extending transit um, across the river, particularly with a streetcar or potentially with an orbit line. Our new bridge that would run south of I-480 um, paired with pedestrian and bike access across the bridge. Um, part of this is related to helping to develop uh, the Dodge Park golf course on the Council Bluffs side. Um, as a region, we're really behind on providing housing at all levels of affordability. And we've got a tremendous number of jobs coming to the downtown midtown areas in particular. So how do we provide connection to this spot, which could be a really interesting new residential neighborhood, um, urban and right on the waterfront. Um, traffic signal system, let's try to not widen the roads where we don't have to. We can upgrade the signals more quickly to get eke a little bit more capacity out of the road network. Cities are, City of Omaha is already working on that um, right now, but what can we do to speed that up and, and spread it across the region? major roadways. We know that despite all of this, there are still some roads that need to be widened at certain spots or truck routes that need to be moved around here and there. Um, that's kind of part of this, but we don't get into the details on that front since that's kind of the status quo for a lot of the, the cities and counties, metro area. Transportation demand management, the idea of employer-based transportation solutions. So. What can employers do, larger employers or universities or educational institutions do for that matter to support um, a wider range of transportation options for their employees or students? Um, Grace has really been an expert on this front and uh, with her work at Virtus Group in helping folks figure this out. And we'd like to continue and expand that system. And then we kind of threw in maintenance at the end because it crosses all of these projects and um, and it's its own thing as well. So that's kind of the broader strategy, thinking about how it all fits together from a regional mobility standpoint. But that urban core mobility system, that's all about supporting a uniquely urban environment that we have in part of Omaha in particular, and potentially the very Western edge of Council Bluffs. And so that's where the streetcar comes into play. You can see here a map of the route. The streetcar route, as it is proposed, is um, shown in the solid red line. Um, the little red circles are the stations. It runs basically from 42nd Street on the west, near UNMC, th through Blackstone along Farnham, um, splits to the Farnham and Harney. Um, the exact point where a split would happen, or if, if a split even happens between the two streets, this kind of TBD until we get to another the next phase of engineering. But essentially it gets down to 10th Street and then goes north and ends at 10th and Cass right in front of the arena. Um, you can see on here as well, connection points to the Dodge Street orbit, the 24th Street um, potential orbit route. And then also we've talked about some extensions uh, to the streetcar network. Again, thinking as with orbit, that would be a starter line for bus rapid transit, this would be the starter line for um, a more urban focused streetcar system. One of these that would be, which would probably be immediate is to the west here, um, extending through the UNMC campus, connecting to the Omaha steel casting site. That's kind of left out of the current plans because um, it would need to be done in conjunction with UNMC's planned expansion with Project Next and their other projects. Um, also across the river to the east, again, I mentioned that bridge. Um, I saw a planner from Council Bluffs on the call here. Hello, but I know that Council Bluffs has been very energized by this whole project and is making a serious go at um, the bridge and the Dodge Park property and the first Ave corridor, extending that. Also um, going south, potentially along 13th Street to the zoo. North, a smaller extension, just up to Millwork Commons, if that makes sense, depending on what happens with development there. And then north, we show 30th Street. The idea here being though that um, based on the outcome of what Metro does with the 24th Street corridor study, 
um, a potential streetcar extension could make sense on either 24th Street or 30th. Um, in some ways, 24th Street could make more sense because of the stop spacing that I mentioned, but it is nice to have an, you know, an orbit line or, or a solid um, bus transit line just on one street. Metro is looking at the possibility of south of um, Dodge on 24th Street, north of Dodge on 30th Street with a jog. Um, but regardless, I think whichever one they don't go on with those improvements we look at for rail. But those are kind of all longer term extensions. Um, the reason this first route was chosen is partially based on the ability to pay for it. Uh, this is a unique area, a unique corridor when it comes to development. It's already seen development potential and pressure, but it, we're getting a lot of like five story buildings. And so what you see with a streetcar is it can kind of create this continuous band of additional development, um, pushing the density up to more like eight stories or 10 stories, right? And that what we see then as well, you've got the kind of the baseline valuation what's going on in the corridor. And that additional development increases the tax revenue that's brought in. And so the difference in the tax revenue the city receives now versus the tax revenue the city would receive in the future with that additional development could be turned back into the project to pay for it in a way. And we can dive into that more um, in the discussion if you want. But the other corridors that I mentioned don't really have as much potential um, for that type of funding or the project spurs development that goes back to pay for the project. Um, so then we would turn to federal sources where we can. But again, um, that ends up being largely based on the potential ridership. And those calculations happen based on current density levels. And none of these corridors really have a high enough density to justify that level of transit investment of a rail line. And so we start to look at other technologies. And again, that's why we looked immediately at orbit or some other kind of enhanced bus system going north south immediately, because that's basically, it meets the needs of the development patterns and it's something that we can figure out how to pay for. Um, so the idea being though that this operates up and down this corridor, it ties into parking garages that are publicly owned, publicly managed, shared across users and really can it become a catalyst for higher level development. Some operating details of the streetcar will be electric, either powered by overhead wire or battery, most likely. Um, I'm guessing we'll end up with a high, some sort of hybrid system uh, where it's on battery part of the time, recharging on by overhead wire part of the time. Each car will carry um, a couple hundred people maximum. It'll operate in mixed traffic on the western part of the corridor, but could have dedicated lanes like the orbit does on, on the eastern part of the corridor. Trains would arrive every 10 minutes. Um, it's about 18 minutes end to end on the route and charging zero fares. And we're really basing a lot of the operational details on the Kansas City streetcar which is just closing in on uh, 10 million rides since it opened um, several years ago. They were averaging about 2 million trips a year pre-COVID, which dropped to about a million after COVID or since COVID. And then real quickly, the, the why cities build streetcars. Convenient and affordable transportation, that's one part. Again, it's a three mile route. So it's kind of based on transportation within this corridor, um, but that's there. But also making more efficient use of the parking distributed throughout the corridor, which I mentioned. But one example of this even is Mutual of Omaha, which is planning to build far fewer parking spaces than a building of that size would typically build, something like half of what a building like that would typically build. They're able to do that because they, they think they can make better use of sharing the parking along the corridor and connect directly to where people live already there. Enable the creation of dense walkable neighborhoods. Um, it's a pedestrian extender. Again, we hear over and over um, that people want walkable neighborhoods. And so this kind of becomes 
a way to build a dense neighborhood where you can walk where you need to go, but you can also hop on this fare free um, piece of technology that gets you a little bit further in your walk. Attracting and retaining talent by providing that urban option for living, again, by build offering a way to build much more densely. And economic development. And I wanted to tap on this real quickly because economic development is kind of a dirty word sometimes, but what we really mean with this sense, if you think back to this map, economic development in this case can mean real estate development. And this is about where buildings are built, where people end up living, where jobs are located. And I'd say it's more of a, is it our jobs gonna end up landing in the suburbs? Are they gonna end up landing in the Eastern part of Omaha? And yes, it's in the Eastern part of Omaha. It's not in North Omaha or South Omaha. It's much, much easier to get to and from the urban core of Omaha via transit or biking or driving or walking um, from North and South Omaha than it is to get all the way out to the suburban fringe. And so what we're trying to do is redirect the development downtown, midtown, um, in a way that, that works kind of for everyone. It'll be operated by a new streetcar authority. And I do see some questions and I'll get to those here when I turn the, person, the slides off, but uh, it'll be operated by a new authority that's created through an interlocal agreement between the city of Omaha and Metro Transit. Uh, Metro has been a very uh, generous and helpful partner in building the in conceptualizing and, and figuring out the operational plan for the, the project and the project timeline. So looking at the rest of this year and next year for design and engineering, then a two-year construction window. Um, and typically you have to have about six months of uh, testing with the vehicle before you can really offer service and then beginning service in mid to late 2026. And I mentioned earlier that this is all part of our broader regional transportation strategy. Um, so looking at how people move around the region and moving within this district. But it's also part of a broader strategy for development within the urban core where we're looking at land use and we're looking at um, you know, re-examining the streets again for those two-way conversions, adding bikeways. I know that this image has a bike in the driving, in the automobile driving lane, um, but having protected by a network of protected bikeways throughout the urban core um, and how we offer a full range of housing affordabilities within the core. And that's kind of a strategy that we're in the process of pulling together, finalizing right now. So with that, um, I'm gonna turn off the slides and then kind of get to your questions, but always feel free to just email me or call or anything like that if you uh, if anything comes up. All right, so real quickly, um, I see some of the questions, um, the parking thing. Yes, um, you mentioned, Sarah, it looks like uh, I said what we typically, what typically would be built for a project of that size. And you said it typically built a, for a project of that size in Omaha, and that's true. And that's partially because we haven't built out our transit network to provide good options in a way. And so what happens is we end up, we haven't had, for instance, in downtown minimum parking um, requirements in the zoning code for decades. Yeah, we still see these folks come in and they want to build a lot of parking. And that's partially due to um, sometimes developers themselves, sometimes the financial institutions that are backing the project, and sometimes the tenants. Um, just due to a lack of understanding of how parking works. You especially see this when you have folks trying to build their own parking and they're not sharing it in a way. And then you end up with this mentality that you need just as many parking stalls as you would have um, employees in one site, um, which is not an efficient way to, to operate it. Generally, what you can do is if you have a garage, let's say that has 100 stalls, which would be a small one, you could rent out you could sell passes for 150 stalls because there's never a time where everyone's in there. So you can be more efficient in a lot of ways. It is an opportunity for education, but it's also, it really requires 
some real investment in public transit. You know, we all know that we're under that side. Um, is this in conflict with Metro? Uh, increased ridership on the orbit. That's true. Um, but these kind of serve different purposes in a way. Um, BRT lines, for the most part, haven't been shown to stimulate the same levels of development and really convince people to move away from providing so much parking. Um, rail transit has had a better history of doing that around the country. An exception would be doing BRT of like a platinum level where you have very, very, you know, dedicated right of way and nicer stations. And it's, that's something that is quite a bit away from what we've got with the orbit line. Um, and so, and the costs of that also end up approaching closer to what we would be paying for with the rail transit line. So um, in that sense, we're basically trying to, again, build out this district with frequent stops, frequent stations. It's a walk extended district with orbit providing an in and out of, of downtown core. ADA accessible, yes, definitely. Um, stations will be raised, be level boarding. Um, there'll be places to um, uh, secure your chair if, if you use a chair, um, or you know, obviously um, prioritize seating. That's kind of a given. Um, what influence do people that live east yet work out west? Cindy, can you clarify that question? Um, sure. Um, one time I was doing a pedestrian count and I was noticing that most of the um, people driving east on, I mean, west on Dodge Street um, at uh, rush hour in the morning, a lot of people, um, they look like service workers or hospital workers like Women's Hospital, Methodist, so forth, and even further west. Um, there's also a lot of like restaurant workers that uh, work out west, but yet live, live east because housing is more affordable east. So um, are, I don't understand exactly how, maybe this doesn't even address that issue, um, that um, those people are underserved, but yet we're um, just trying to focus on the urban core, so to speak. Um, so I just, I just wonder if there's anything that's going to address that. Yeah, great question. We kind of call that the reverse commute in some ways, where it's people going in the direction that is against where the numbers are going in that way, right? Um, typically from an urban core out to the suburbs is what that looks like. And in, in a lot of ways, this is, this, that's why this is part of that larger system. And so I'm trying to share it as that context. This isn't the tool directly to address that. One way of looking at it could be, okay, we see a lot of development in the urban core. Maybe there's different job opportunities closer to where people live. Okay, that's one part of it. But the other is really, we need to improve the transportation kind of across the board. And so again, keep on Metro next. And one of the things that they're, one of the options, they're kind of presenting three different scenarios with that of ways that they can improve their system. Um, it's kind of looking at this classic uh, coverage versus ridership um, option that you have. The idea being with, um, if you wanna support ridership with public transit, you find the corridors and the routes that are in the highest density areas that already see the highest ridership and you offer better service there, right? But you kind of shrink your service area to do that by focusing your resources. But in doing so, you're kind of leaving people out, right? And so the other option is coverage where you maybe have less frequent service, but you offer bigger, longer routes, routes in more places. And that's kind of the fundamental tension you have in transit planning is which one are you doing with limited resources? And so Metro next, they are kind of proposing, there are baseline improvements across the board that they're doing, but they really are looking for, okay, as a community, what do we want to prioritize? Is it that coverage? Is it getting to new spots? Or is it, you know, your tire checking the schedule for what time your 30 minute frequency bus is going to get there and you just, you want more 10 minute routes, you know, that's kind of what they're working on. And that's something that we're trying to support them with, but that's probably where that answer lies more um, on that front. How likely is development from downtown to the zoo? I think like any of the extensions of the streetcar, um, some of the stuff is opportunistic, but I don't think much of this is like immediate for those extensions. Um, again, kind of looking at 
federal sources of funding, all of that is a much longer time frame from the idea of concept to actual project operations. Like you're looking at like 10 to 12 years um, once you decide to like really go for it versus where we are now, of, you know, five years out, four years out. And so um, it's something that's it's certainly in the mix and in the queue, but it's definitely not like immediate. Um, okay, Harney Street pilot um, lane conflict. Yeah, so I think that um, this comes up a lot. I've been asked a lot in the Harney Street bikeway pilot project. Um, something that obviously, I mean, from the very early days of mode shift where we were trying to coordinate a way to get people to go to the transportation master plan meetings uh, at our earliest moments. And then the Harney Street Bikeway project came out of that and, and then it kind of started and fizzled and started and fizzled and started and fizzled. And now we are, now we have it. And we have it in kind of this, we really do have it in this pilot project format right now where it's um, the flexible delineators. Um, they're not bolted into the ground. They're kind of popping out in that way. I think what we've learned here is that that's probably not the best treatment to have a protected bikeway. And so we need to look at a more robust investment. And at the same time, with the streetcar going in, you know, it's pretty dangerous to ride a bike parallel to streetcar tracks that are in the street um, when you can get your wheel stuck in between the track and the, the concrete or the rubber boot next to the track. Um, it's, it's pretty bad in that way. And so what a lot of cities end up doing is they build a protected bikeway, a nice one on the same corridor, you know, and that's something that I think that we would need to include in our engineering. Um, and again, I'll be able to talk about this more soon, but I think that we're also pushing really hard for the full network and protected bikeways. Right now, if you look at a map of the bikeway network, or sorry, the bike facility network in the urban core, it's highly fragmented um, and pretty low quality facilities. And so it's like, well, yeah, we don't see a ton of use on them because there aren't very many and they're not connected to each other. How do you get to and from them? And so I think, um, yes, there is a potential conflict there, but that's just another justification for making a better and or making the investment in a better quality facility. So I'm all for that. Cool. And any other questions? Thanks, Stephen. I just want to say a couple of words. I appreciate you being here. I know that historically Mode Shift has, you know, had tough questions about the streetcar uh, and been semi-skeptical for many years, but I think it's an important conversation to have. Um, I just wanted to briefly highlight some of the things. We recently did a blog, you know, and you may have seen it, Stephen, and others may have seen it. Um, you know, I think we're excited about things like increasing density. The corridor will obviously be more vibrant. It will be more exciting place to be. It'll be easier to move around, um, I think, for everyone, except some of those issues with the bikes and the streetcar. But it sounds like you're on top of that and paying attention to that. And so that's really great. Um, I think some of our main concerns that we highlighted in the blog were around sort of use of the TIF. Um, which you talked about, right, in terms of the future tax revenue. And, you know, I think some of that is related to air, the area being blighted or maybe even extremely blighted, which seems not quite right for that area of town, um, which I think Senator Wayne has also highlighted. Um, I think we also had concerns about the ability of like the parking funds to fully fund the operating expenses. And then had some concerns around, it seemed like, you know, you all in Connect Go have done some really good public engagement and transparent and like conversations, but there were, you know, nobody knew about this until boom, all of a sudden uh, there was the library announcement and then there was the streetcar announcement. Um, you know, and I think 
it is an opportunity for the city to think about vision zero and pedestrian safety and bike safety and everyone's safety in the corridor. Um, so that's something we wanted to highlight, but just wanted to, you know, put that out there, um, but also happy to have other folks ask questions. I don't know if anybody wants to raise their hand or if you want to respond to that, Stephen. And then if people want to raise their hand, I see Clyde raising a hand and Thomas and Ryan. So we'll start with we'll start with you three after Stephen, if you want to say something. Well, and then um, my question or comment is that uh, I think another aspect that needs to be addressed is traffic enforcement. Uh, it's really uh, lacking in Omaha, and it's really making uh, it very unsafe for pedestrians and cyclists because uh, uh, especially during for some reason during the pandemic motorists are speeding a lot more and they're also don't seem to be obeying the uh, uh, like no right turn on red and and other uh, traffic control devices and it, it's uh, I've just experienced a lot of near misses myself uh, and it's just uh, it's going to be pretty scary just thanks Clyde I was going to mention this earlier. Um, obviously, as, as the Chamber of Commerce, um, there's a limited amount that we actually are in charge of when it comes to this stuff. I mean, really, we're a player and like trying to build partnerships and do the outreach and, and make those connections. And where we have to, you know, we'll do a, a study here and there to kind of push something over the finish line. Um, but as far as, um, thanks, Sydney, we, we try to be influencers. Or better, better or worse. But anyway, um, I uh, guess I would just say when it comes to enforcement, um, I know that that's at least part of, of the Vision Zero piece, but I, I, it's not an area that I have a lot of history working. So I'll keep it in mind in conversations, but that's about all I can do on that front. Yeah, well, and I would just add on, I think Mochift has had some conversations in the past about enforcement and some conversation about you know is there a role for red light cameras is there a role for more enforcement and i think it's you know it's a tough conversation i think it unfortunately there are a lot of folks you know our system doesn't treat everyone equally and there's a lot of folks that are disproportionately impacted by the use of those things and i think that's really important part of the conversation oh sarah is adding some more comments on that in the chat that's great yes um so, I would just, I would echo that. I mean, yeah, I think that there are some problems with enforcement when it comes to, um, you know, um, I can't think of the word, oh, discretionary enforcement and things like that, you know, who does it really land on, but yeah. Yeah. Um, okay, I took, there were some people who raised their hand like this, and then some people raised their hand the other way, so um, Thomas, I think I saw you next in terms of hand raises. You're muted, we can't hear you. Oh, if this takes longer. Ryan, you wanna go? You were next and then Thomas, we can come back to you if you can figure out the muting. <laughs> Ryan, there you sure. are. Sure. Uh, yeah, so uh, thanks for all the work you've been doing, um, Stephen, and I appreciate you know the way you've tried to make accessibility into the survey data and all, and all that. Um, but it seems to me it's not really a secret. The streetcar is primarily happening because it's going to make wealthy people who are the property owners, developers, business owners, uh, even wealthier through this uh, process. The financing methods proposed also meet the mayor's goals of not having to or of being able to minimize spending of tax revenues on multimodal stuff uh, through using the, the TIF. So my question is kind of how can we bring to bear pressure to make things like bike infrastructure and vision zero policies part and parcel of the streetcar design, since we know this is something that the, the local elite here are willing to really put um, political pressure and resources into, right? So they benefit from the what's going to happen to their asset values and access to, to labor they can profitably employ. Uh, so where are our points of, of leverage to sort of roll some of the things we've been working for into the package of this sort of streetcar juggernaut? Uh, you know, where do you I know you guys are doing what you can in, in Connect Go. So where could Mode Shift um, kind of get involved with that? The other thing on a related line, I don't know if you have information. Um, I've found out today that the parking division's revenue 
is around 10 to 12 million a year. And the mayor's press release said that it's going to be fare free because it's going to be funded entirely by parking revenue and to the tune of 6.4 million. So I'm not sure whether the idea is that there's going to be some, there are some implications that there was going to be an increase in people driving downtown and parking, and that's going to increase parking revenues. But I don't know if that's like a 50 to 60% increase or whether you're going to have 50 to 60% of existing parking revenues being diverted into running the streetcar or kind of how people think that's going to work. Right, thanks, Ryan. Yeah, well, I mean, first off, I guess I would push back on that initial contention that it's just purely a money grab in that way. Because um, I do think it is about kind of rethinking the way that we do development in a broad sense that really is about like, how do you make this spot that's a better place to live and more connected to other folks. But um, but I take your point in, in one sense of that. Um, I think as far as like getting involved for this corridor, there'll definitely be um, at least some engagement opportunities when it comes to redesigning the corridor. Part of that related to what's going on with the transit stops. Hey, hey Cleo. Um, but what's going on with um, like where the stops are, because that's going to be um, still kind of like TBD as far as like we don't impact um, some of the businesses or other organizations that are operating on the corridor. But then also what exactly happens with the street reconfiguration. Some of that will happen with the streetcar project. Some of it will happen with an upcoming, oh, I've got an hour here, but um, some of it will happen with an upcoming uh, project that the city's launching. They're going to look at all the streets. Like I mentioned, the street reconfiguration, probably starting in the fall, they're going to be going street by street, trying to understand how the space could be better utilized. Um, and they'll definitely be a large part of public engagement tied into that. And then right now, the city is also about to kick off their bike ped uh, master plan. Um, and that's also based on, on public engagement, which will be nice to have a, a city focused version of that. Um, and then on your Park Omaha piece, uh, if you look at the Park Omaha Parking Division just released their master strategic plan. Um, which does call for them to kind of rethink the way that they're using their um, uh, revenue and the way that they try to balance or subsidize parking in different ways. Um, the goal would be to make the parking more self-sufficient um, so it's not subsidized from other parts of, of, the, of the general fund. Um, and so with that kind of rebalancing of, of all of that, that should free up additional dollars to help support um, transit ridership. And by that, I mean, it could come with um, fee increases. Thanks, Stephen. All right, Thomas, I think you got unmuted. Can you, yeah, my wife is my tech yes. expert, so thank you, Sharon. Um, could, could you address the lack of white striping? The striping is disappearing the, in my, uh, area in uh, Morton Meadows and over at the 32nd Avenue bike lane. Could you address how that the white striping uh, for pedestrians could be improved or, or maintained? All right, well, I, I guess I don't know specifically the locations you're talking about, so talk about specifics, but um, I know we generally have you know, it's hard to keep up with, with painting and we don't always do the best with the region, you know, anywhere in the region for that matter um, with the marked crosswalks. But I guess that's not, it's kind of outside of my purview, I'm afraid, Tom, so. Well, my question would be, um, who would we address this issue to? Because since I, I'm visually impaired and can't drive, mm -hmm. I'm limited to riding a bike or walking or riding the bus. Uh -huh. So who would I ask that the pedestrian striping be maintained? Who would I talk uh, to? Great question, Tom, um, on that point. You can call, actually on that point, um, you could call the mayor's hotline, 444-5555. And for folks who do rely on walking or transit to get around, I know they do, they prioritize um, 
marking crosswalks where people live. Uh, and your, uh, oh, and one, your one, job. one other. Like job. Can I ask you one other issue on the Blackstone crosswalk that? That that could have been installed but wasn't. Was it was it at 38th or 39th? Could you just address that issue? That might be a better question for someone else here. And Stephen, if you want to talk about that, you can. Um, Sarah, I think you could talk some about Blackstone. You were involved in some of like the Walk With Us event and some of that work. Um, I guess you and Brandon worked on a blog on that. Yeah, unless Stephen, you want to jump in about something with Blackstone, but um, Tom, are you thinking after the woman was killed in Blackstone or just in general, how they weren't going to put crosswalks between 38th Street and 40th Street leaving? Well, and whatever, whatever you would like to talk about with, with uh, pedestrian crosswalks, uh, specifically in Blackstone, I'd appreciate it. Yeah. I, I, I'm just talking in general terms. Yeah. There's definitely a lot of work to do. Uh, and Blackstone specifically, they have improved the lighting. I will say that that is good. I uh, follow up with my OPPD contact on another thing, but they've actually doubled the loom or the watts of some of the lights. Um, and then they, what I was grateful to hear, we presented to the BID, their business improvement district board uh, last month or something, and talked about some uh, improvements and recommendations that we had to their upcoming streetscape plan, because we were, I'll speak for myself, I was horrified that they're, fancy new plan still didn't have crosswalks at 38th Ave or 39th. And so we pushed back on that. And I guess they'd heard it from, I'm sure it wasn't just us, but um, they are now attempting to update their plans to include more crosswalks, which is great. So I, as always, am impatient and think it should have been done yesterday. Um, so I don't have a solid timeline on it, but there will actually be crosswalks at 38th, 38th Ave, 39th and 40th and some good news. We pressured them uh, as I'm sure others did as well to remove the beg buttons. So you don't now actually have to push the button and wait. The lights turn to walk with the green light for the car. So it makes a lot of sense. You see that in a lot of pedestrian districts and it should have been done there a long time ago in my opinion. But small victories, we have to celebrate those. Good work, Sarah, and everybody else who is involved there. Thank you. Um, well, and just since Tom had a question or Thomas had a question about the um, painting the street line, Cindy, I know you've done a lot of work to get stop lines painted at like 72nd and Dodge. So I don't know if you want to say brief, if you have some words briefly, or if you want to put something in the chat, if you have any recommendations about who to talk to. Cindy's shaking her head no. Um, I know Modeshift has also done some work to elevate um, crosswalks such as, what was it, 50, was it 52nd and radial where there, it's like near a school and it's a big, intersection and there's no there were like the paint just was gone and there were no crosswalks and we helped get the city we brought attention to that and the city painted them but it is unfortunate that we can't just have nice things like paint which i don't think costs that much in the scheme of things but um let's keep going down the stack of people um avon is that how you say your name avon yep that's how we say it um, and my question is, in the recent planning, um, what discussions have been had about housing affordability and displacement? That's a great question with this. I mean, obviously, a large part of what the project is trying to do is increase property values. It's kind of hinges upon that. And that can mean increased rents for anyone on the corridor. And so trying to figure out how to avoid this being a mass displacement machine is kind of is front and center um, in our minds. The way that this works from a funding standpoint, majority of it, again, coming through TIF, um, on the front end, over the period of time of collecting this money, um, it's the funding's pretty tight in that way, right? And so there isn't a lot of cash up front that's spare. However, once we get um, just a little bit further along in paying back some of the bonds, we start to collect actually more than we need for this one project in that way. And so the, the idea has been all along, build that into an affordable housing fund um, that would go towards supplying affordable housing within the corridor. Recognizing of course that 
there are a lot of people already working on this piece. And so um, partnering with them to kind of, uh, I guess, match the funds and probably actually administer the program. So uh, like someone like a front porch investments or whatnot. Cindy's skeptical, I see, but anyway. But no, I mean, that's been kind of front and center actually on, on thinking about this. Yeah, good question. Um, I guess we'll move Brandon. on to Brandon or Stephen, you wanna say something? Oh no, I was just gonna say Brandon, but he had a question. Yeah, so I know that the streetcar map um, it's not, you know, final yet as to where it jogs south down to Harney Street from Farnham or, you know, all that. Um, I was just wondering if, I, I know one of the other 10 plus M priorities was like studying, converting the one-way streets to two-way streets in kind of the urban core. I was wondering if uh, maybe there's been any thought as to whether or not the engineering phase of the streetcar uh, might include like looking at finally converting Farnham and Harney to both two-way streets so that the streetcar doesn't have to jog down to one of the other streets. It can just go east and west on the same uh, corridor, if that makes sense. Yeah. You know, so I think, so the engineering phase will definitely include that as an option. I would say though, you don't actually even have to two-way the street to have two-way streetcar. You could just have a dedicated kind of entreflow lane for the streetcar where the streetcar runs the opposite direction of automobile traffic. And trying to figure out the traffic signal timing, you know, it's that trade-off where it's like, okay, if you have the one-way streets, it's actually easier to time the traffic signals to give the transit system um, priority and also just have it not have red lights as often. When you're dealing with the two-way travel, it gets a little more complicated on that way, but it's also more intuitive to have it all in one street. And so there's kind of that, that back and forth in that way. So I'd say as far as Farnham and Harney go, that would get considered as part of the early on engineering for the streetcar. As far as the rest of the urban core goes and the Omaha part, it would be um, as part of a study that um, the city's gonna do starting this fall in partnership with MAPA, I should add. I see Laurie's got um, in the chat mentioning that the Farnham, the, UNM, the project next at UNMC kind of has a big part with um, the area of, of uh, Farnham Street uh, west of Saddle Creek. And so the idea of making that two way all day um, is that's more of what's going on with that part of the study east of UNMC be more driven by the streetcar and other needs. All right, other thoughts? Yeah, does anybody else want to raise their hand and ask a question or put something in the chat? I think we could go a few more minutes um, if there are questions. A lot of good questions so far. Yeah, I appreciate the questions. Um, you know, this does help us, helps me think through things um, quite a bit and all that front. But I will say, I mean, jump out now if you have one, or otherwise, again, really don't be afraid to, to email me or give me a phone call or whatever. So, so Manny, did you want to ask a question? No, I just now noticed that my mic is on and then the sound making it look like I want to ask a question, but sounds good to me. <laughs> no worries. Thanks, Manny. <laughs> yep. Anytime, Steve. <laughs> cool. Actually, no, sorry. I have a question if I can ask right. it. Um, the So I know that Metro Transit has been you know, dealing with the same kind of operator shortage that a lot of transit agencies have been dealing with. And, um, uh, you know, knowing that, I am uh, curious what the plan is for operating the streetcar and um, just operator, you know, staffing and training if things have gotten to that level of detail yet. 
Um, I would say specifically, no, I haven't gotten to that level of detail. This next phase of engineering also includes developing the operational plan, which kind of comes into a lot of that, but presumably, you know, we'll have operators on these vehicles. Uh, Metro Transit, like every transit agency in the country right now, has a super bad shortage of drivers and mechanics. And so uh, that's always going to be a challenge. And it's certainly a challenge as we talk about this project or any of the other projects we're talking about with improved transit, whether it's better frequency or, or new routes. Um, we're trying to figure out how to work more with uh, Metro Community College in particular on that front, um, and, or also help Metro like kind of improve the talent pipelines, but it is really hard um, on that front. And Manny, self-driving streetcar, well, when, when they can finally recognize people riding bikes or walking, um, maybe. <laughs> um, but Anyway, I guess I would say that a lot of that's kind of like up in the air still and partially dependent on what happens as we come out of COVID, if you know, but it's going to be a stress point no matter what for all the transit projects across um, the board. Ryan, I think I see you raising your hand. Cindy, are you also oh. trying to raise your hand? No, okay. All right. I'm gonna have to get off in just one second, actually, but I'll answer um, why separate streetcar authority, why not just operated by Metro. Part of that's like the local funding piece, Metro relies on federal funds. They're trying to put a firewall between this project and the rest of the bus projects so that making sure that, you know, it's not like funding for one is taking away from um, the other. And so they don't get, there's not like a, a situation where you know, we have to cut bus service to support the streetcar and things like that, knowing that that bus access is kind of their first priority, no matter what. Um, and then Ryan, I was wondering if you could you just call me or shoot me an email or something and we can talk more about that if you had your question, because I just got to run. Sorry. Bye. Yeah, no, thank you so much, Stephen. Appreciate it. There were lots of thanks in the chat. Um, we'll put the recording online and yeah, I appreciate everybody's questions. Thanks for being here. I'll hang out for a little bit after I turn off the recording if people have thoughts or questions or updates. Oh, reminder to put stuff on that kudo board and appreciate Sarah and say thanks and tell stories or share pictures or whatever you want. Um, can share that again. But thanks, Stephen. Right. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, everybody.